So welcome everybody, it's 6.15 and to another edition of the Rochester Select Board in Town Gathering. Um, is there, uh, we have, um, someone else is coming, yeah. But we have posted the agenda in three places, correct? And on the website and emailed interested parties so we can move forward. Hi Burma. Come on, right up front. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you get for being. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. <clears throat> we got one here. <laughs> um, at this time, we'd uh, like to take any additions to the agenda that were not already posted, and I have one of them already. Chris Matrick is here to speak about the. Um, um, what Mason had requested information about the new rules on public um, comments on for service projects or, or federal projects, I guess you could say. So add him. And I, Walt. Comment on Harvest Fair. Mm hmm. And I believe that, uh, oh, Mason, you have. Oh, it's a well, your hand, yeah. Um, so, uh, I noticed that we're in the process of thinking about a town generator. Uh, at least there's an advisory for it that was printed in the paper. I would just hope that we start establishing our town mission for our efforts to deal with climate change in reference to that, because my personal preference would be to see us develop solar with a battery backup instead of continuing to burn more fossil fuel in the event of more more problems. And I would like that suggestion, maybe it could be a joint effort between the park house and the town in the sense of uh, uh, of that mission, because uh, the park house is also now looking to uh, deal with the generator. So consequently, if, if our concern is more weather events and potentials for problems, well, how do we want to address it? Okay. Okay. Um, I'm thinking that, um, Jenna, you might fold in um, underneath Rachel Cunningham, but um, Jenna is, what's your last name again? Kowalski. Kowalski is here from the Vermont Agency rural development. rural development, yeah, Council on Rural Development, and um, in response to our request for her to come and present information, and we'll go into that when we get to you. But I want to add you to the agenda and yeah. under Rachel, okay? Excuse me, Jenna, I'm here. Could you come and spell your last name? K O L L S K N. Oh, I'm great, right. thank you. I just want to make yeah, sure good job. <laughs> and anybody else? Is that enough for now? All right. So I'd like to start with the minutes from the last meeting, which looked complete to me, and I'd move to accept those as typed up. I second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And I did hear from Tom, he's not going to make it. He's on an airport run tonight, so it's just Patty and I. And get the, um, <clears throat> so the, um, I guess I'm going to try and start with the people that have come from the farthest, but before I let you go in, Jenna, with your, um, Chris, you came in to um, respond to the request for information about the, um, the new proposed rules about public comment period and stuff. Would you want to give a brief summary of your, what's going on with that? Yeah, sure. So in, I'll try to be quick. So um, it's the U.S. Forest Service has for many years conducted projects and they took advantage, they took the time to go back and look at uh, all of the decisions that they made um, using environmental analyses um, to conduct project analysis and looked at what the outcomes of those projects were from a, from a decision point of view. So when you produce an environmental analysis, the outcome, you either find a significant effect to a resource or there's not a significant effect. And so if you find no significant effect, and that's just use Robinson as our example, the Robinson Project, the finding of no significant impact for the Robinson Project. So all of those projects could move forward. So what that means is there's no significant effect on the ground. So we have another category of analysis called categorical exclusions, which um, don't require as in-depth of an analysis. So what the Forest Service has done 
is they've um, proposed some rule changes to add more categorical exclusions to some of those categories of projects where they repeatedly, over and over again, had findings of no significant impact on a project. So it's, some of them have to do with road building, road decommissioning, um, repair and maintenance of recreation facilities, special use permit issuances, um, restoration projects, watershed and forest restoration projects. So they proposed, on the Pat prints them out here, and I have a couple more I can add if people want to look at them. Some new categories um, that we can do categorical exclusions. Um, the, the, the change in categorical, what categorical exclusions don't require the same level of analysis and they don't require the same level of, um, or the same number of public opportunities to comment um, on those projects. It doesn't mean that there's not an opportunity to comment. Um, it, what it, it, typically the scoping is up to the discretion of the line officers. That would be me, I'm the ranger. So I would look at a project and I would say, you know, we are painting the Rochester Ranger Station, which we did this summer, and I didn't outreach to anyone in the community about painting the Rochester Ranger Station because that's a category, repair and maintenance to administrative facilities that I did, didn't feel the need to. Certainly, if I were to consider decommissioning, uh, you know, five miles of the Bingo Road where it's on National Forest System land, I would certainly reach out to the public um, and have a scoping period where the public could comment on it. I think that the, some of the messaging that's been out there, it's been a little confusing when you look at, you know, the, if you look at the Federal Register and you ever try to read Federal Register announcements, they are a bit dense. Um, and it's sometimes hard to tease out exactly what it means on the ground. So if I were to sum this up in, uh, in, a, short, in a short sentence is that locally you will not see any change in the opportunity to comment on Forest Service projects than the public has had in the past. Um, we'll still be, you know, if there's a timber sale, if there's road construction, road decommissioning projects, um, we will certainly put out a, a scoping period, a 14-day common period, a 30-day common period, whatever's, whatever's appropriate given the complexity of the project. Great. Mason, does that answer your questions about that? Uh, well, I was, uh, you know, read about this in the paper. Yeah. The front page, and there was... You know concerns about uh, that were spoken about in that article, and I'm not totally sure you addressed some of them in the respect of. Uh, if you want to ask me, I'd be happy to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you know, uh, and I, when I had mentioned it to the select board at the other meeting, I was concerned that they had heard from you prior to it being in the paper. And they, they had. They um, all the towns on the Green Mountain National Forest received. Uh, a notice through our schedule of proposed actions of the opportunity to comment and then when that got extended they were notified again um, of that opportunity to comment. The town? The town. I mean the, uh, the select board? Yes. And it was and it was in the newspaper as a legal notice as well I believe. Yes. I, I, guess. Yeah. I it was sure through. people understood. I, I admit I don't read every email in depth that comes across my desk. You know, my, I try and fish out the ones that seem critically you know, you know, relevant. Yeah, Harlan, you had a question. Oh yeah, it just seems like you know it came up. By the way, did you get my message about the trash and the campsite? No, no, no. <laughs> about this subject? Yeah. yeah. Um, it just seems like it showed up in the paper like on a Thursday, mm -hmm. and the last day to comment <coughs> on it was Monday. Yes. I mean, I mean, out of control. The, the, by the cloak the, and dagger. The, there was no cloak and dagger. I mean, this was a public was announcement that went time. out to through all sorts yeah. of media outlets nationally. This was put out national because it's a national thing. It's not just specific to the Green Mountain. It was out. In, a, in the Federal Register, April. which is publicly announced in legal notices in their their paper of record and their media outlets of record. Mm -hmm. and, and then, then it was extended for another, I think, um, 15 days beyond the original period that it was out there. So it, it was it got a lot of national media attention. Um, and again, we, we put it out locally as well. The article that came out in the Herald was one of um, wasn't the first one that came out in the local news outlets. There was an article, I think, in the Rutland Herald. There was an article in the Burlington Free Press about it as well. Um, so there was plenty of public notice to well, come. Supposedly, the Wigan Valley Herald's our paper of choice or yep. paper or something. It is. 
Well, the Florence off. paper of record is the Rutland paper. Yeah, I only so. had like I had to hustle, you know. The, yeah, I, under, I understand. And I mean, as I understand it, the national forest is supposed to protect and preserve the forest, right? <coughs> Correct. The people, In, including people. Yes. You know, for the people. Correct. And I, you know, nobody really cares if they paint the, the building up there, but right. anything to do with the forest. That you're supposed to be taken care of for us, you know, it just seems like it should be public and, and there and there was and there public was input. I mean there was the opportunity to comment on, on, on yeah, the world changes. Like hundreds, I think tens of thousands of people have taken the opportunity to comment. Yeah, but if this thing goes through it's gonna be less public. No, that's that's not necessarily <laughs> true. What they're doing is they're they're changing the discretion on the level of comment. To the, for some projects to the local man, me, the local line officer, the local ranger. So instead of being mandated to require, you know, two 30-day comment periods because I have to do it, what they're saying is, is it my discretion on the complexity of the project and the level of public interest in the project, how many opportunities to comment will be provided? So it's providing more, more flexibility at the local level. And the reason that you saw no comment in the newspaper, that, that there's in all the local media outlets, there's been no comment from the Green Mountain National Forest is because, because of the national nature of the rule change, they're asking all official media inquiries to be directed at our Washington office, so the message that's coming back out is consistent. So that's why the, and they, didn't, they contacted the local, our local supervisor's office in Rutland, I think the Rutland Herald did, and they were directed to the Washington office media department. And this isn't, this isn't project specific. That's one thing to be clear on. This, we talk about a rule change. We're not talking about any individual project and not having the opportunity to comment. That's at my discretion. So, you know, if we did, redid the Robinson project today, all over again, we'd have the same number of opportunities to comment for the Robinson integrated resource. Well, that's because we're dealing with you. Uh, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, our whole know, the whole success some, of our program in Vermont is based on robust public engagement, and we've been doing that ever since Forest Plan Revision in 2006. Um, and, and there's not, we don't have any plan to change the approach because the way that you can interact, each forest has its own personality, and it, its public has its own personality, and the public wants different levels of input and involvement, and we know that the public here is very interested and wants to be very involved in the decisions that we make about the management of our national forests, your national forests. Thank you for... Uh, I have yep. one other question. Does this include the wilderness areas as well? If there were a project yeah. that was um, that was focused on management of wilderness areas, then yes, it would. Wilderness areas being the most a previous uh, uh, interest in doing something in the wilderness area. You mean? No, like if there was some like so, let's say that we hadn't analyzed the Philadelphia Peak Repeater um, removal as part of the Robinson project, and it were a project unto its own. Um, it would provide me the latitude to figure out how how much public involvement would be needed in that particular project, but not the designation of wilderness mark. It wouldn't affect. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. Yeah. I figured you would have a lot better understanding about that than I did. So. Yeah. Appreciate and, uh, it. If you're you know if you're very interested in this, I, I do advise picking up I one have of those. It's, four handouts printed yeah, here. Yeah, I have mm -hmm. a couple more. I can put <clears throat> Yeah, great. Um, so the um, Christian, you're here to talk about the stormwater um, um, project going down at the town garage for the, through the White River Partnership. Yep. Thank you for having me. I'm Christian Tonkin, I'm the program coordinator at the White River Partnership. And I just want to give you guys a quick update on the scope of the project and where we're at. Um, so if you haven't heard about it, we're doing a project at the town garage. Um, it's a stormwater project. We're trying to capture the flow that runs straight down to the garage here. And the biggest uh, aspect of this project is we're putting in a hydrodynamic separator, which is, sounds complicated, but really all it does 
does is spin a lot of the sediment and, and stuff in the storm water and that'll settle out. Um, so when the storm water goes into the, the river, we're hopefully capturing a lot of that sediment and it's not going into it. As part of the project, we're installing a few catch basins, a dry well, and a manhole. as some new infrastructure to help collect that water and bring it over to the uh, separator. Um, and so we uh, had a pre bid meeting for this project today, and we had um, ECS Excavating and Harvey's come out to the meeting. Um, and we're kind of on a tight schedule for this. We're trying to get this done. Um, by mid-October, so Cooter can get all the sand staged over there. Um, and so we were hoping to have our, our bids. Our bids are due by next Monday at 4.30, I believe, in the afternoon. Um, we had some questions. The previous meeting today went, went pretty well. We had some questions about paving um, over there. And as we dig up and install some new piping and catch basins, what uh, level of paving we're going to do. and I think Cooter has a good solution on how to best um, save money and, and still have a good functioning um, area over there. When we dig it up, we might um, do some a hard pack solution instead of repaving the whole area, which would be very costly. Um, so yeah, we're excited. The White River Partnership's really excited for this project. Um, we think it's a really critical area to capture the, the sediment and prevent that from going into the water source and um, yeah, we're excited to get it going. We're hoping to implement in the first few weeks of October. And yeah, happy to answer any questions that you guys have, any any details on the project. project. Um, you said hoping to implement means the end of October and when do you expect Yeah, so um, I think this is going to be a pretty quick project. There's nothing um, too complex. Uh, the hydronet dynamic separator comes in a precast concrete, almost like a catch basin that it comes in. So it's really just installing that and the actual technology of it is already set up. Um, so I think this is going to be a few days tops to, okay. to get it done. And so we're going to work with, with Cooter and make sure we find a window that works to try and have as little disruption as possible to get these improvements in and then have them done. So all set to get everything ready for winter. Just a quick question. Can you um, give us a, a picture of where that's located in relationship facing the town garage? Yeah, so if you're standing in front of the town garage and looking at the bays, um, and then there's the salt shed over the side, the separator is going to kind of sit in between that. Um, and but we're going to collect water if you're looking at the town garage um, on the right hand side of it. Um, that's where kind of the water is pooling. It's going to come down there and collect into a um, a catch basin there. And then we'll have uh, a set of new piping that comes across the front of the town garage. And we're going to put a new catch basin right in the middle of the town garage in between the bays, so it won't affect any of the movement of um, any of the trucks in and out of there. Um, and then that will flow to the complete left side of the town garage over kind of where the salt shed is. That's where the um, third catch basin will be to collect any more um, runoff. And then that will go directly into the separator, um, which will cycle out and all the sediment will settle at the bottom of the separator. And then we'll have um, <coughs> piping that leads directly from the separator out to the river. What do you do with the sediment that's collected? It's going to have to be vacuumed out. Um, there's a maintenance schedule. I think it's about once a year that that sediment gets vacuumed out. So these are permanent structures? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. yeah. How, how do freezing conditions affect it? Um, I don't think there's going to be any uh, open issues with any freezing with the, um, there's the plastic pipes. You have 15 and 18 inch pipes. Um, and the, the separator, um, I can look in for details, but I don't know of any issues with it running in, in cold weather. Um, it's just an obvious question. I have a question. How is it being funded? Uh, so this is funded through, uh, through the block grant system through the state. Um, and we have funding through uh, the money came to us at the White River Partnership, so we're only the project uh, with a matching portion, portion coming from the town. Um, we have to let the, 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 the water 
clean water block. Yeah, I had two questions. What type of volume is are you looking at? Um, I'm not sure about what the overall volume of stormwater that um, is is captured or the actual number of sediment that is the goal to to catch. I can try and find that out from the engineer and report back. Though. So when it's being discharged into the river, does it first go through a, a kind of a marsh filtering process also? No. Or is it going to be straight pipes from that? No, so this is going to go straight. Um, it's like our road runoff from here, uh, straight from the road into the catch basins. Um, one other aspect of the project is there is a proposed no mow area with some vegetation along the river that's there now. And so that's going to be left undisturbed. So hopefully if everything isn't captured and gets into our catch basin system and into the separator, that will have a little bit of a buffer for it to run through. So that little bit of a buffer is a quasi design capturing system. Yeah, um, I would say the separator though is the main thing. We're hoping to capture the bulk of it. It's more yeah, of a, um, a little something actually. Where, where the potential of a, a, a marsh situation would help capture other potential contaminants, mm -hmm. of which hazardous materials, of which I think is another subject it, it, that's been talked about in the town. I mean, this would, it, it, is there a reason why you didn't look into um, that aspect of it. There's no room there. I don't know. What's the distance? Well, I mean, this what's the distance, distance, distance good where to where we treat the pipe to the river? This is, <laughs> it is tight there in that area, and that's certainly, a, I know in, in the design process there were um, discussions about vegetated swales and options like that. Um, and I think in the spot, uh, the separator was determined to be the best course of action. It's yeah. definitely a step in the right direction and one of, of three proposals that were given to the town. One also for a, um, um, something to catch down here where we have a lot of runoff going into this creek and the, the biggest, probably eventually most impactful, I think, would be a um, catching the main runoff off of Route 100 that is now dumping out at the bridge um, at Robinson Avenue and talking about a, a bigger underground system in the um, the new park that we gained after Irene. So that's um, this is a, a step in that that yeah. direction. This is the yeah. smallest of the three systems. Yeah, these yeah. are all identified in a um, stormwater planning process. Yeah. Now, so yeah. Away at some of them. Well, thank you for the update. I'm glad it's um, with all the other things happening in town. It's nice to see that we're not only uh, responding to disasters, but trying to yes. um, work towards the future. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Preventative. Yeah, thank you. all right, yeah. thanks for coming. Uh, we, I guess we would like to, in, in the interest of um, people that have traveled far and, and also near, um, Rachel, you wanna start with um, your presentation sure. from the Envision Rochester and also with our guest, Jenna, um, who is, um, she's probably come the farthest, I guess, to, to be here tonight, yeah. I'll let Rachel start and then I yeah. 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 yeah, there's, Vic and I are both presenting tonight. I'm the half of the Envision Rochester. Um, I'm not sure if, if I've met everyone here, but my name's Rachel Cunningham, and uh, I'm a co-founder of Envision Rochester. And uh, we're giving a very brief presentation and a more substantive proposal to the board we've printed out for you tonight. That's a little late, sorry. <laughs> so let me very briefly say, um, we've got a couple of uh, goals tonight. Um, first, we'd like to present Envision Rochester as an independent, community-based resource to the Rochester Select Board. We're also seeking Rochester's, Rochester Select Board's official endorsement of Envision Rochester as a community resource. Um, and we're open tonight to discuss any questions about Envision Rochester's potential partnership that we'd like to propose tonight with the Vermont Council on Rural Development. And we have a representative of that organization here with us tonight. Uh, and our final goal tonight is to uh, 
respectfully recommend that the Rochester Select Board invite the Vermont Council on Rural Development to partner with us in Vision Rochester to conduct a community visit program, which is, quote unquote, a structured process that enables a community to identify, prioritize goals, foster local leadership, and it will serve as a catalyst for the development and realization of concrete, achievable action plans. And uh, our, our uh, visitor tonight can speak to some of those processes and, and what that means in more detail. So very briefly, I just wanted to answer a question that a lot in the community have been asking. What the heck is Envision Rochester? Okay. We're an independent group of residents, business owners, and volunteers dedicated to building a more vibrant and resilient local economy. Um, we have a history that we've shared in previous gatherings, and I'm happy to go into those uh, later in question time if anyone has a question. But fundamentally, it started with Sue Roboto and I asking, how can we help the right hand know what the left hand is doing? And we thought of the community calendar as an initiative to kick off a way to unite community resources and volunteers. So from that, uh, we've had a series of meetings. And what followed was an outpouring of ideas, suggestions, and a sense of urgency that something needs to be done to put Rochester back on the map and attract young families and new businesses to sustain our town and preserve our unique role in the White River Valley. So uh, many of you I, I recognize from our series of gatherings, some are new, um, but I want to be very clear about what our mission is and then I'd like to hand it over to Vic uh, so he can go into more details about why we formed and, and where the community is sort of urging us to go. So our mission very plainly is to organize work and resources to help build a more vibrant and resilient Rochester economy. If endorsed by the select board, Envision Rochester plans to build on our momentum, broaden our network, and identify potential partnerships and collaborations with our neighboring towns across the White River Valley. And there's some specific things that I think Vic can speak to, so I'll hand it over to him now. And I'm happy to answer questions later when it's when it's appropriate. Yeah. yeah please. So as as uh, Rachel spoke to, we um, a number of Rochester residents come together to consider what we love about Rochester and what might place the long term future of Rochester in jeopardy. And regarding the latter, we know that the population is slowly aging and shrinking that the high school closed last year, and that formal cost increases to operate town services are outpacing growth of the municipal tax base. So we feel that these kinds of events suggest the town uh, may be turning towards economic fragility and possible decline, which threatens the vitality of local businesses, our remaining school, and our quality of life. So we, we think that the town has a choice, either to do nothing and just let this risky scenario play out or work for change. And we chose to work for change and, and started this initiative that we call Envision Rochester. Um, there have been a number of uh, community discussions, as Rachel alluded to, and a lot of brainstorming came out of that. And just to give you a sample of some of the things that were identified, uh, building affordable housing, creating tax incentives for local businesses, uh, creating a multi-town river walk uh, trail, uh, attracting appropriate new businesses and jobs, and restoring the amount of hunting and fishing to plentiful levels that used to be in the past. Uh, so uh, our vision is for Rochester to be placed on an economically sound footing uh, with successful businesses, including new businesses. <coughs> high quality of life in a place that is highly desirable for permanent residents, second home residents, and tourists alike. We seek to encourage and enable the community as a whole to determine the exact nature of that vision, what it really means in terms of concrete changes from today. And this would be accomplished, we suggest, by a community-wide visioning and goal-setting process uh, which uh, Jenna Koloski will speak to a, about in a bit. So based on the vision, we have some short-term goals we, we hope to accomplish. Um, 
one is and i'll just tick off six um, so within the next six to 12 months what we would like to see happen is uh, to organize and lead a community-wide consensus building process that results in a shared vision of what rochester should be in the future and we would retain an expert private consultant to help guide and facilitate this process Following that visioning work, to organize a community-wide consensus building process that results in shared goals and priorities to achieve that vision. And here's where Vermont Council Rural Development would begin to play a role in this work as a guide and a facilitator and coach. Following that goal and priority setting work, create implementation teams composed of local volunteers partnering with staff from the relevant regional and state agencies uh, and they would create and execute work plans. Fourthly, work with and monitor and support implementation teams report progress periodically to the Rochester community. Fifthly, establish a private not-for-profit entity that can seek grants and private donations to foster implementation of economic <coughs> development goals. And then sixth, explore with neighboring towns where there might be areas of mutual interest and benefit. Then medium term, looking out one to three years, create, once we have a, uh, a base of decisions made about what the, the future ought to look like and, and priority goals, create and, ex and execute a branding and marketing strategy to help propel economic growth and continue to implement work. Long term, what we, what we hope to see happen, uh, you know, looking out even beyond the, the three year horizon, that the downward slide in population is reversed and population growth takes place to a level that maintains our cherished small town scale. This is not a plea for unlimited growth by any stretch. There's, there's, a, there's a maximum, I don't know what it is, but that's to be determined by the community. Uh, if we'd like to see annual property tax increases that are sufficient to meet our needs, but don't exceed rate of inflation. We think that's important to work for. We'd like to see new appropriate businesses open here, creating new jobs. We like to see barriers to attracting young families, like lack of affordable housing and daycare, overcome. We like to see our school uh, academically excellent and maintaining high enrollment, and that uh, tourism would continue to flourish here and even grow. So, in pursuit of this agenda, we need the help and expertise that Vermont Council Rural Development can offer, and we therefore respectfully request the Select Board to invite them here to work with us. And we also ask that the select board recognize Vision Rochester as the lead organization to work with Vermont Council to plan and implement their program. Thanks. Thank you. Any questions? Or mm -hmm. I'll move on to Jenna next, and there may be questions after all. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, I'll we'll stand too. Sure. Uh, I'm Jenna Kowalski. I'm the community and policy manager with the Council on Rural Development. And I did bring. Um, I brought a, a list of our board members just to give a little bit more sense of who we are mm -hmm. and also a little bit more about the community visit program. So um, I'll share that with okay. the select board and then if anyone else wants a copy, there's, there should be plenty there. Mm -hmm. um, so I work for the Vermont Council on Rural Development. We are a neutral facilitator of public process in Vermont. Um, we are actually um, authorized by the federal farm bill as a convener of public process, but it doesn't come along with any sort of authority or funding of, of any sort. Um, we are uh, an independent nonprofit organization and we get our funding just like a lot of other nonprofits do from various different sources. But what the federal farm bill does let us do is have a really unique board structure um, that really provides the backbone of the work that we do. So our board is made up of several members of the governor's cabinet. It doesn't matter if they're what party they're from. Um, we are a nonpartisan organization. We have representatives from federal agencies, always USDA Rural Development, the Vermont Community Foundation, several nonprofits, community leaders, businesses, and then we have representatives from all three congressional offices. So um, that structure gives us kind of a unique um, connection and perspective on, on rural Vermont. We work with communities all around the state. We have been for the last 20 years. We've worked with about 70 different towns through this community visit process. Um, we also work at the state level. So when we work with towns, we kind of add up the things that we're seeing, trends, and what's important and what issues are affecting rural Vermont. And then we have statewide policy conversations about that as well. So we've held um, statewide conversations on the future of the working landscape in Vermont. So supporting food and farm enterprises on the digital economy in Vermont. 
Um, so we have those conversations too, but the, the core of our work is really at the community level where we facilitate community conversations. I want to say up front um, that I, we have met with Envision Rochester. Um, it, it seems like they have kind of a great vision for the work they want to do uh, in the community. We, when we work with the community, we don't work for any group in particular. We work for the community as a whole. And that's why it was important to me to meet with the select board. Mm -hmm. We only work where we're invited by the select board um, to work in a community. It's important to us to know that the, the process has the support of the community as a whole. Um, and that's important for the success of a process too. So um, I guess really quick, I'll just walk through uh, what a community visit is all about. Um, essentially, a, a community visit is a four month series of public meetings. It's all about connecting the whole community together to identify kind of common goals and initiatives, to choose priorities, what's most important to the community today, and then to build action plans um, to implement those priorities. We know that towns have town plans that are critical to the future of the town, um, that towns kind of go through visioning and planning processes. Our process is really about action. Um, it's important to us not to just kind of build a plan that sits on the shelf. It's really about saying what's important to us today, what are the three things that we as community members want to work on now for the future of our town, and not to say what should the select board be doing, or what should the planning commission should be doing, or what should people, you know, from Montpelier or Washington be doing to come to Rochester and do for us. It's about what can we do as a community together, what do we want to work on today as, as community members. Um, the process works in kind of a, a three-step way. So the first step in the process is something that we call the community visit day. It's really, it's kind of a celebration of a community, but it's also a lot of business and it's work to be done. Um, it's a series of forums throughout the afternoon and evening and a big community dinner. And we invite everyone in town to come out and participate in a series of brainstorming discussions. So um, in many towns, we see upwards of 150, 200, 300 people, depending on the size of the town. We do a pretty deep engagement and invitation process to invite people from all different parts of the community. It's really critical in these processes that they, they're not seen as for one part of the community or another. It's for everyone to engage in and participate in. Um, and we collect ideas in, uh, throughout the series of forums. At that day, on Community Visit Day, we also invite a team of top state visionaries and leaders to come to, to the town for the day and to listen in on discussions. And so um, if the community decides they want to discuss transportation, we'd invite the Secretary of Transportation, we'd invite the congressional offices, we'd invite USDA Rural Development, we'd invite people who could help support a community in the work they have to do or to bring funding to a community. Um, but we're very clear with them that it's not a day for them to come and give speeches. Um, they're, and they're not used to that, to coming to a community, but, I think, but they like it. They get to sit and they get to listen and learn about the communities that they're serving in the state. Um, so they're here for the day. They listen in. They share some reflections uh, at the end of the forums, but it's really all about hearing ideas from community members, and all ideas are welcome. Nothing is thrown out that day. We take notes of everything. After that meeting, we do kind of a cluster analysis of all the ideas that came up. So you can imagine if you hold a forum on transportation and you hold a forum on economic development, you might see some common ideas come up in those forums. So we add those things up to, you know, what are the big ideas that we're hearing? We come back a month later, and you go to, you know, the school gym or something like that. You put the ideas up on the wall and walk through a pretty disciplined voting process. So this is the point in the process where people can, um, community members can stand up, can kind of describe, here's what I think is most important. It's not a day for debating back and forth, you know, we should do this and not this and get to get in fights back and forth. It's really to say, here's what I think is most actionable, most important, here's what we should work on together. Um, that evening we go through a voting process and then we actually ask people to sign up for task forces to work on, um, on those initiatives that are voted on. And so that evening we walk out of the room with a list of maybe three priorities that a town's gonna take on a list of people who've signed up that want to work on it. Um, and we head into the next meeting the following month um, to do some action planning. So the final meeting, we call it the resource day, but really it's an action planning day. It essentially serves as the first meeting of the task forces that have formed. We facilitate conversations to identify what are the things we need to do now to implement this initiative and what are the resources that are out there to get it done. So we really want to go from the big idea to the action steps. Um, and we bring another team with us. So at that point, 
we don't kind of look as much to the big, like to big visionary leaders, we look at who could work with this community to help them implement this project they're gonna be taking on. So um, right now we're working with the town of Greensboro. They are working on, they voted, they prioritized building water and sewer infrastructure in their village center. Um, it was interesting, I think a lot of people came into that meeting ready to vote on improving housing or attracting young residents or these kind of initiatives that were critical, but they realized, well, you know, at first we need to get this infrastructure built so that we have the platform to, to build on. Um, and so we're assembling a team now of um, we have USDA Rural Development, um, the Department of Environmental Conservation, um, folks that have dollars and technical assistance they can bring to that community to help them work step by step through a process to bring water and sewer to the, to the town. Um, and so after that meeting, we end up with action plans, we have task forces, we bring a final report back to the community that captures everything. Um, nothing is lost in the process. All the notes from that initial brainstorming day, all the ideas that are on the wall, so nothing's thrown out. But then at the end of the report, the action plans for the priorities that were chosen, and importantly, the contact information for all those visiting team members, all the resource team members that were there, listening in, getting to know the community, and understanding what's important to the, to the town to take on. Um, so it's a process that's about action, and it's about kind of um, work getting done from the ground up in a community. Um, I think our fundamental values and principles in, in the work that we do is that when communities really identify what's most important and line up um, from the ground up to get things done, that really um, incredible things can be accomplished. So that's the community visit process. Um, I have had some conversations with Envision, Envision Rochester about the potential for that process in Rochester. Um, I will say, uh, we offer this process free of charge to communities, except for a couple things that we ask them to help out with, which is the dinner and a mailing, inviting folks to the, to the first meeting. Um, so you can imagine there's a lot of interest and demand for the, mm -hmm. for the process in Vermont, and we do have kind of a waiting list of communities that are looking to bring this process to their town. And we're committed out fairly far in terms of the communities that our board has decided to offer the process to. Um, so we've had, just to kind of lay out a few different um, options, uh, we've had the conversation about potentially inviting a full process, in which case um, we have an advisory committee that kind of um, decides where we offer the process to next, but it could be well into 2021 um, until we could commit to another community beyond the list that we already have. Um, but we do also sometimes work with communities in a shorter term way. Um, especially where communities have already decided in a couple areas where they really want to work. Um, we can work in maybe a two-month process that helps to identify priorities and then build action plans or connect to resources. And there's kind of a more limited way that we can work together, which can be helpful in some communities where um, maybe they don't need as big of a vision in conversation but have some issue areas they want to work on and we can kind of do a targeted um, precision process to get to, to action with those things. Um, and I will just mention that our advisory committee, we have a representative from USDA Rural Development, from Vermont Community Foundation, we have a deep partnership with uh, Agency of Commerce and Community Development, folks that know Rural uh, Preservation Trust, folks that know communities well in Vermont, they're very interested in regional conversations as well. We recently did a first ever four town process um, with South Royalton, um, or sorry, with Royalton, Tunbridge, Sharon, and Stratford, which was a fascinating exercise in collective visioning, and um, and there's some interest in, in more processes like that in the future, too. So there was some murmuring in the advisory committee about, you know, is there a regional conversation to be had in this area? And I don't know. And I think that's the fundamental thing I'll leave it with, is we don't know what's best for, for this town, or for any town. Um, we're not social engineers or anything like that. We um, work in service of Vermont communities in, in any way that we can be useful. Um, so I'm happy to answer questions about the process, and I'd also love to hear reflections from the select board, but certainly if you wanted to open it up and hear reflections on whether something that, like this would be useful. Um, it doesn't hurt our feelings one way or another if it is or isn't, but I, I'd be curious to know. It helps to get a sense of a community to know um, whether we can be helpful. Well, I have a question. If we did the abbreviated, shorter take on things, could mm -hmm. that be considered like a preparatory step to the bigger 
process down the line, getting in, in line for that, or is it like a whole separate, you would consider that's, that's all you need to do? I think it potentially could be. Um, I think it may be challenging. Did you want to? Yeah, I might be able to find it. We're also in discussion with a uh, consultant uh, who's worked with other towns, including uh, Bethel, who's currently working at Woodstock, where perhaps we could uh, undertake the visioning front end of it first with a private consultant and then bring in Vermont Council at a second stage and then on a limited basis than would ordinarily be the yeah. case. So we think there may be a way, and we're exploring how to do this both with a consultant and with Janet's agency about how we can put something together that we wouldn't have to wait so long. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. it's a good product. Yeah, and I think and the our committee knows, so Rebecca is the consultant that he's referring to, and, and we know her well. We think she's wonderful, and she really would be very skilled in helping to identify that kind of bigger picture vision. You know, our organization admittedly is a little bit less about visioning and more about kind of action planning. Um, although some of our processes, some of our towns do decide to do a little bit of a visioning exercise up front. Um, but it's very kind of, um, it's kind of just a list of vision points that help to guide the process. Uh, Rebecca could do a deeper visioning, probably. And at which point, you know, if through that process you were to identify a couple of kind of concrete initiatives that uh, the town wanted to work on, mm -hmm. we could potentially then help to um, guide and facilitate some of the action planning and maybe bring in some resources. You know, an example, we worked with uh, Chelsea recently where they knew that they wanted to work on um, the development of a community, like a, not necessarily a co-op, but a cooperative community grocery store or market in town. And they just need a little bit of help to facilitate some community conversations to really identify how to take it forward. Um, and what people wanted. And we were able to help facilitate that and then to bring in some resources to meet with them and think with them about next steps and connect to them. So, so that's something we could think about doing in the shorter term. Mm -hmm. But in terms of like working together in that way and then thinking in a more regional way. That would be I, redundant. We've not. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I don't think it would be prohibitive of, of working in a bigger way, although it would be difficult to just think about how that works. You, you bring the town together mm -hmm. to work on some concrete initiatives and then to open it back up to, again to, to kind bigger. of all the different things okay. you can work on. Yeah. It might just be tricky um, for people to follow yeah. in that, that process. So I take it that the Envision um, Committee's interest is more in this um, shorter um, yes. Shorter program. Yeah. Because yeah. we've actually, as Jenna knows, yeah. we've moved ahead on mm -hmm. uh, quite a bit of outreach. Yeah. We have a heck of a lot more to do, but. Um, so, what kind of schedule are you on for these um, fast track programs? <laughs> Yeah, we kind of fit them in when we can, mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. so I think what I would do if um, if the select board were to decide to um, kind of authorize in, in Vision Rochester to kind of continue the conversation with Rebecca mm -hmm. and with us, mm -hmm. I think we would just have to um, bring it back to our board mm -hmm. and get their <coughs> approval, and then think about where we could, yeah. you know, what right. would work with the town's timeline and, and ours. I know that we have couple commitments to shorter term processes in communities, but sometimes we can kind of fit them in between. Can you explain who Rebecca is? And uh, I'm, I'm assuming she is the expert private consultant. Mm -hmm. And where does her funding come from at this point in time? Mm -hmm. I would have to turn that to... Um, it's a great question. question. She is offering on October 2nd a free, uh, very um, detailed workshop with our steering committee to help us prepare for, if we get approval from the mm -hmm. select board, to help us prepare to hit the ground running. That's for free, and that's a, that's a considerable uh, amount of time that she's going to give us that evening. Um, on top of that, Vic... Uh, so just, uh, if there's required work beyond that initial meeting, it probably would be, we would seek private donations to help fund that grants for the case. Okay, w w what are uh, Rebecca's title? What's her credentials? She's a partner of Community Workshop, and I can get those contact details for you. She's a partner of Community Workshop. The, her, her firm is called Community okay. Workshop LLC. Okay. And we first learned about her in October, thanks to the Herald. There's a terrific feature piece on her, which I will 
I will get to you. I just didn't have time to attach it to the presentation. Yeah. You have to forgive me, Pat. Okay. Uh, no, I just want I just want that to be out there. Sure. Mm -hmm. Rebecca Samborn Stone. No E on the Samborn. And she's a Bethel resident, Yale educated, mm -hmm. and she has I've been briefing her for mm, more than a year now. She's so busy, like your organization, but we've taken coffees and I've updated her on some of our initiatives and what, and that's why she's still interested in working with us. She sees that we're making progress. So okay. we're grateful to that. Is there any other public input? I, I have Fair a question. Um, what do you want from the select board in terms of approval? What does that mean to you? It's what way? Um, Basically, it sounds like they're they're looking for our endorsement to to say we approve of this effort to um, to uh, uh, you know get these resources to help you know investigate the the problems that we're facing. So does that mean you're working more closely aligned with with their goals, or how are you we're, we're, accountability for? I don't. I don't think. I think it's basically we're we're um, we're asking for their their um, you know we're giving approval to their their desire to to work on behalf of the town, you know, and with the town. And with the town you know. When you say yeah. them, it's us. Envision Rochester is us, our community. I, I just wonder so. if you've. Um, it seems as though there's so much already happening in Rochester. There's so many organizations and clubs and groups. I wonder if you've attended all their meetings and been apprised of all the projects they're currently working on or would like to work on in the future, if you've gone to all their meetings. And I'm only one person, and we have a steering committee of 10, right. most of whom, all of us, are business owners ourselves right. and volunteer already. There's only so much we can do, so we rely on the community to participate and, and fill us in and, and invite us and yeah. And, and plus, I'm also new to the community, so a lot of I'm doing my best to network. Sure, uh, I but, understand. But I think your question is really, really important about accountability. Um, we we are independent and we're volunteer based. It's us. It's our community. So we're forming so that we could then help gather up resources, expertise, reach out to further networks and resources to help our town. But the thing, the important thing to remember is that we determine what we want. We determine what the, what the priorities are. We the community. We the community. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Be clear. <laughs> we the community. From, you know, from our public works employees who show up at community meetings, so, you know, all of us. Um, so part of that, determining those, those priorities, comes through uh, the facilitation process through the community visit program. Oh, no, I lived in this community a long time. So yeah. I participated in a lot of different aspects yeah. of it, and I find it's a very vibrant community yes. right now. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. it we is agree. right mm -hmm. now. Uh, my only question would be about getting younger people to uh, show up and what do they want? That's the big question. That's right. What do the young That's people right. want? What's your experience working with young people? Um, yeah, I think I can answer a couple of your questions from our perspective. I, you know, I can't speak to the role that Envision Rochester would play. That would kind of be up to the, like you say, up to the community to decide. But in terms of the community visit process and how it works, um, to answer about the, the select board's role, you know, we look for an invitation from the select board, but then we work on behalf of the whole community. So anything that's decided is coming from the kind of people at large, right? And they're not official town decisions. So, you know, in Greensboro, when they voted to work on um, improving walkability and bikeability in the village center, that doesn't mean it's happening tomorrow. It still needs to go through all the steps and processes that any initiative would have to. Um, but it's something that's kind of now supported by the, the people as a whole, and it's up to, to folks in Greensboro to, to work on. Um, in terms of ideas that I think every community, um, I won't say every, most communities have a lot of things that are already going on in town, right? Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's initiatives, there's projects, there's groups, there's organizations, and we know that. And in fact, we think that that's the reason that Vermont communities are thriving, right? It's because people are already doing all this great work in towns. Um, we're very careful in our process that when priorities emerge, 
So number one, oftentimes there's a lot of wisdom in the room when it comes to voting on what the priorities are, right? So someone can stand up and say, I don't think that working on water quality right now is a key issue, because we already have an organization in town that's doing that, but no one's working on the bike lane in the village center, right? So the group can kind of decide collectively what's important to work on today. And we also, if things rise to the top of prioritization, we're very careful as a facilitator to identify is this redundant or is this getting in the way of something that's already going on? Or in fact, does the thing that's already going on need more energy and new volunteers to help boost it? Um, so we're, we try and, and work in that way that supports and doesn't hinder or get in the way. And, and what you say is critical about, I think the, when I, a, a process is successful to me when there's new people involved. When the leader of a task force is, has never done anything else in town before. It's not the select board member who's on the school board and the planning commission and whatever else. It's a, it's a new business owner in town who's interested in water and sewer for their business. Um, yeah? Um, I just had a suggestion, and I don't know if probably, I don't know if, it, if you uh, or anybody on the group has worked. Have you got anybody like Carrie McDonald from the PTO down at the school and stuff like that involved? Yes, uh, we're, we're developing those relationships, and uh, it's very important to us. It's key. Well, I mean, you wanted input from young people and their Yeah, we've been working on that. Down at the school yeah. who have kids in the school. And not, yeah. and what brought them here? I've, I've met a number of young couples who've moved here and in the last three, four years, and, um, you know, why did they come? Well, what would make them stay? You know, that we've had some good yeah. initial discussions with Megan Payne. Yeah. Right, the school wonderful. And, yes. Christine uh, Mayer is you know, a young person teacher. born and raised and now right. a teacher and yeah. uh, thinking about future. I was just thinking that was yeah. a good resource. Yeah. Um, Absolutely, and we're developing those. Okay. In fact, thanks to uh, Jenna's suggestion at a steering committee meeting, um, she encouraged us to go and attend the leadership summit. And th that, those were key issues that we talked about at, those, at one of the three workshops that I attended. So yeah. We're working on it. Okay, great. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Mason, could you step out in front of the camera so everybody else gets on the camera? You might as well also. Yeah. 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 Um, Vermont Council of Rural Development. Development is the key, and the state is looking for poster child projects or to, to help other rural communities. Yeah. Our town has. Uh, 200 hookups to its septic system, which is a leach field on the White River, Site 4, which we already have rumors that if that fails, we are in the process of looking at a, uh, a treatment plant. And let's talk about those numbers. There well, are other ways to deal that. with septic, dehydration. These are these are things that young people are working on in the White River area, big time projects. We can be the poster child community as the headwaters of the White River as we dump into the other communities. This is the type of inspirational stuff that can help people move to our community. These are working people's issues, not tourism issues. I'm interested in working people's issues. We all are. So that, that would well, be. We all are. I hear more about okay. tourism than I do the working people. It sounds like he's joining in Vision Rochester. Any other questions or comment about a process? Just interested to see what the board had to say about their request to approve uh, them. Well, we have two out of three of us here, but um, I, for one, am interested in any any efforts that are going to to um, bring more resources and more help to the town for improving our situation here. I don't know. What do you think? I think it's uh, worthy of following. Um, I hope it gains some legs under it and continues on. Um, like I have said before, there's some of these organizations have popped up along the way and they lose steam. So um, I would encourage keep the steam risen and, and keep going with it. So I would endorse it at this point. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I would make a motion to, to officially endorse and envision Rochester in their um, attempts to, to keep things vitalized and, and, and more so, and, and also to work with the community development. I second it. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. <laughs> I don't think Tom would be disagreeing with us on this, no. but, uh, but he's not here. But yeah. So, Thank you. So yeah, go Thank you. please.
go forth and prosper. And <laughs> yeah. keep, us, yeah. keep us informed. Yeah. 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 And just a kind of logistical thing from us, is the one thing that we ask for is just a letter from the select board mm -hmm. that invites yep. these to work. Nothing official or too detailed, but just something. But that official that. still, nonetheless. Yeah. 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 Official? Yeah. Official, yeah. official, unofficially <laughs> official. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you for traveling here to give us this information. Um, um, cool. Um, <coughs> all right, we got. All right. So let's move on to Jeffrey. And you, you're back here to talk more about your issues with the um, noise in the village. Yeah. Well, you sent an email asking Susan to come down tonight, Susan Bennis, mm -hmm. and she's not able to, but she sent me with a letter okay. that she'd like me to read. All right. Um, read referencing the covertly approved outdoor liquor permit and related. Problems. Covertly approved. Okay, you're just reading the letter. It's okay. Dear select board and attendees, we were unable to attend tonight's meeting. Erna and I are here in spirit and intent. Erna and I were both surprised in June when the Huntington House lawn sprouted a large, large, a number of large tables with various colored umbrellas, string lighting around the perimeter, and a fire pit. Our biggest surprise was yet to come when in July we had numerous nights of very loud profanity-laced drunk patrons disrupting the quiet enjoyment of Erna's home, on some occasions literally making it impossible to sleep. Upon researching how this was allowed to happen, our neighbors and I discovered, one, the lawn outdoor liquor permit was issued covertly as only the yearly renewal of the Huntington House's license, which is first approved by the town, and then sent on to the state to their state license. As the March meeting at the March meeting when I was approved, select board members failed to speak about the lawn outdoor permit, with constitution which constitutes a change of use that should have been identified and put before <coughs> the townspeople for their consideration. Furthermore, the town failed to notify the business owners of the town and state noise ordinance guidelines, which are not in sync with the 12 a.m. permit. When we spoke to the business owners directly as a courtesy, they did not understand our noise complaint as the town had granted an outdoor permit until midnight. We weren't being disappointed as our letter to the town about the noise issued date in August 10th did not even yield uh, the courtesy of a reply. The town select board literally took no action to solve the problem they had created. We were left no choice but to pursue this matter with an attorney to assure that the problem is resolved promptly. Regards, Susan and Erna. Janice and I and Susan and Erna have um, sent a letter to the board. Yeah, I have that here. So yeah. I don't know if you want that letter or not. It's pretty long. I don't know if you yeah, want to so read. I mean, it's like basically, aware I'm aware of it. Yeah. So yeah. the noise was as bad as it's ever been on Saturday night, um, well into the night after dark, um, to the point where the police were called. Mm -hmm. The state police who were, um, because the, the, con the town constable doesn't exist, the town sheriff is off. Ludlow police referenced us to the uh, state police. You called the Ludlow police? That's where the phone rang. <laughs> okay. Um, they referenced the state police in Royalton, mm -hmm. and the state police wouldn't come out for a noise complaint. Right. And they called the Huntington House, and after that phone call, they immediately pulled everybody inside, and the noise abated to an extent. Mm -hmm. So I understand that that phone call was made between nine and nine thirty. Right. Right. Which is relatively early. I there there is reference here that the select board took no action, which is actually not true. I mean, we have been in communication with the, the Huntington House, who is the, the noise makers at hand here, and they have agreed to to limit things outside to 10 o'clock and to try and dampen down the enthusiasm of their patrons. And, that's, um, and there is currently no noise ordinance in town, so that was their, their you know, agreement that it uh, was, you know, reasonable to, to I think they are trying to to work on this, you know, in terms of sound. It's not, um, I mean, to be making phone calls before 10 o'clock and 9 o'clock. I, I also called the Department of Liquor Control, and they are aware of this, and they were, um, um, they were called also, I think, at 9, 10 that night, which is on a Saturday night in the summer. It's, um, that was, um, you know, 
not the not the middle of the night. But anyway, the 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 um, the statement that the the application was issued covertly is a little bit misleading. I mean, this is a public meeting, and the public is invited, and this is a those permits happen yearly. It's it's on the agenda. It was warned on the agenda that that was you know. So it's not it's not like we're trying to sneak things around. You know, I understand that it's been. Um, an, an issue and has been communication about that but in terms of a change of use I brought this to the planning board and presented it to them and they all agreed that that was actually it's not a change of use that's what the use of that property has been for, for decades so in terms of it being a in a not properly worn change of use that's that's not a that's you know viable. not there that's not a viable complaint on there you know so so where do we go from here well, you know the about your yeah okay yeah. for your minutes of the select board of the meeting i think it was the first one in, in august mm -hmm. the state noise is from the state noise law is right from is dark, from dark dusk, to dusk to dawn right right, right. Um, the use of the property was never an issue before because clearly both the clientele and owners were very different in, in quality um, this has only been a problem since the um, clause was put on their liquor license and that wasn't discussed that was changed on their liquor license there's, so, a, 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 there's a clause in the upper left hand corner that was not on their liquor license mm -hmm. previously that was on their liquor license this year that was put in a different font that was never discussed um, my uh, comparative comment would be people used to not wear hard hats on construction sites but since putting them on they've had substantial amounts of decrease of head injuries um, it's always been done that way but that doesn't make it right um, it was never an issue before. Noise was never a problem on that street. The lights going on all night, the chains, the signs falling all, all over the place in, in, in the public right of way were never an issue until the summer. This has changed substantially. Both the liquor license has been changed legally with the comment in there, that statement, as well as the application of it by these people. Fair enough. That's I, um, I. I guess moving forward, the what I would assume the best way, or what I feel the best way to deal with this is when this comes around and it's time to renew their liquor license again in the spring. That all this history going out there will be stated what is on the liquor license. What now has been agreed verbally with them in terms of toning down the time you know I, I heard it was said at one of the meetings that they could do whatever they wanted till midnight well that's not really the case I mean we all know that's not 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 real but you know? the implication yeah. is there well and that's what they're, they're verbally pointing to on the page yeah when I say you guys are being really noisy mm -hmm. we can do whatever mm -hmm. we want the board has told us we can do this yeah it's well they're realizes. they're running a little a little far with that so that's like an you know, the, yeah, um, I'll just say it one more time. Yeah. The people who had been using the lawn previously to these people had never presented a noise problem. This was a noise problem with these owners, with their clientele. There's a difference. All right. Well, Rachel? I'm one of their clientele. Okay. Yeah. No, well, you do that. care because you're here. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty, pretty quiet. I enjoy outside. I'm delighted they're there. But I do think, uh, you know, it's interesting. I came back from the Middlebury Film Festival on Sunday night. It was 11 o'clock at night, and those bright lights were incredibly bright. It was just coming down Main Street, and mm -hmm. it was 11 o'clock at night. And I thought, oh, it's Sunday. I'm sure that's probably bothering some folks. That did occur to me. Um, it'd be nice if, uh, you know, there was some awareness for neighbors, not yeah. only the yeah. noise, not only the noise. But with the lights. Yeah, um, I can see that. The lights have been addressed in the water. Oh, as well as signs on town property. That one of yeah. them actually says, open until you're done drinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah. it's really. This I, is different. I, if, if I can just comment, I, in my view, I think it's about having a really respectful conversation. We're and past that. We're past respect. I, 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 if I'd like, I'd like to finish this. If we can have a respectful conversation with the business owners, because it really is a wonderful anchor business. Um, and 
I have to say that the owners have been particularly supportive of different community events and showing up at Pierce Hall Community Center and really supporting some of the fundraising efforts that we've been doing um, as a community. Yeah, there's, there's, so it's. I'm grateful for that. I just wanted to have. I, 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 I and, and we're grateful too. We were just yeah. like quiet evenings and not bright lights and neon. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's what's very mm -hmm. disruptive. Yeah, it's, it's a very reasonable request. And, mm -hmm. and I think yeah. if handled well, I think there shouldn't be a problem. We feel a little bit respectfully on your investigations. Yeah, we have, point. we have addressed it a number of times in writing, uh, visits across the way. If it was like this when we looked at the house, we never would have bought the house. If I wanted to live across the street from a Bronx Italian restaurant, I would have moved to the Bronx. I understand. All right. Marvin, you have a comment? The magic formula is 70, 70 decibels at the property line is allowable, and that's not considered a noise nuisance. Anything over that is a nuisance. Hmm. 70 decibels, get, get, a, get a counter to prove it. I have spent the weekend and today right up until about 5.30 this evening uh, polling, surveying, speaking with um, other neighbors um, in the area, even closer. Um, and uh, for the most part, um, I just wanted to know if those people were not coming forward with an opinion for or against um, so that we knew how that was being supported by other neighbors and um, generally um, the other neighbors are in support of keeping the business going the Huntington house and they don't seem to express a large uh, amount of noise coming their way um, they find it to be something they can tolerate for what it's worth, but I, I disagree with that. It doesn't mean the, to diminish what you're saying. No, it doesn't diminish what you're saying, and I disagree that the the time for a respectful conversation is is done because I, there's no sense in giving up on that. You know, this is not something that's going to just just all of a sudden this is different now. This is going to require, you know, work from both sides. You know, and it's. Um, I, you know, I, I did. I called the liquor agency this morning, and he came and inspected the premises in response to, I presume, your complaints or Erna's. I guess it was Susan that called them, and um, he found no violations, and he, and he reiterated that he's going to continue to inspect the premises, and, and um, this talking with um, they could not be here tonight. Regina is out of town, and her husband called me. He said he apologized for not being able to be at this meeting, but they're open tonight, and he's the one-man show there tonight. And they're, um, as the previous presentation was all about, we're working really hard to keep Rochester energized, viable business. And now, does that mean that anything goes? No, you know. And I would, um, I would expect that they will will be able to rein the enthusiasm in a little bit and 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 you know find a compromise that would work but i know you don't seem to feel like that's that's worth trying anymore but that's um you know that's that's what we can do you know we contacted them at 20 minutes of 10 um via their facebook post mm -hmm. um, we were told that they have two weddings going on feel justified in doing whatever it is that they want to do until 10 o'clock. Because somewhere along the line, as they were told that 10 o'clock was now the time, that they could make as much noise as they wanted to until. Well, that's a, a big improvement from them saying they could do everything they wanted till midnight, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Or at one yeah. in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. Right. 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 Mm -hmm. So, so that, that's evidence of them trying to rein things in a little bit, I would say. You know? It's like saying that the fire is down to 200 degrees from 210. Yeah. You really don't. Yeah. You're still get burned. Yeah. Annie, did you have a comment? No. Yeah, I, I would just like to uh, say that it's the first year that they're in business. Um, and I think for all people that are new to uh, either a business situation or to a community, there's a learning. There's a learning period. And they will discover for themselves that perhaps the topic beneficial to their business practice or it isn't and they'll have to adjust because we all do learn how to do that. Um, 
think that if they want to stay in business, which I'm sure they do because they have an awful lot on the line, they'll be very open to a discussion at a time when they're not in the full swing of their business um, with a huge amount of, um, you know, a huge amount at stake for them, you know, completing what they're supposed to be doing that night. So I think there's a time and a place to have, you know, a conversation that can be heard and, um, and with all the right people that can do that, you know, including a mediator, somebody that... Uh, we, we were going to try that, but apparently the restaurant blew that off. Well, like they said, it's like they're in the middle of their season. And if you know anything... Excuse I me, do know a lot saying, about business. Well, no, if you know anything about rural areas, particularly places like this, where the season is the summer, and the winter, like come, you know, once it starts snowing or raining in October or November, that's the end of your season, if, if that's what you're doing here. If you're catering to, if you're catering to seasonal activity. So you're so, giving them the excuse that they're too busy to realize that they're affecting other people's lives? No, I'm saying that they're in the middle of their business, so. They're in the middle of actually trying to complete what they said they were going to do, whether it was a wedding ceremony, a wedding reception. It was a bunch of drugs or, hanging out on the lawn with a I bunch think, of little kids. Listen, you know, I'm not qualifying. Yeah, so I'm not qualifying for people <laughs> that are there. And I don't think we can do that. But what I think we can do, if we really want to have a peaceful outcome, is give them the time and the space to do what they're doing this very first year and then come back to them and say, from so the community. So that's okay then for us no, to be looking me. up at night. Can I just finish? That this is not working for the community in this regard and it works in that regard. But I'm not the community. I'm the guy living across the street as guests are getting woken up in the middle of the night. Well, you are part of the community now. But I'm also an individual who's being affected by them adversely every moment when I'm being affected adversely. And you're saying that this is justified because they're busy? I'm saying that everybody deserves the benefit of the doubt. I gave them the benefit of the doubt a number of times until Saturday night when I had to call the police. At 9.15? Yeah. That's too early. No, it's not. Business. Yes, it is. Uh, when I can't hear my TV because kids are screaming, it's too late. It's, it's too late. Okay. Well, here's the thing. It will have to be resolved, mm -hmm. and it will have to come in. And the best way to do it is at... It is our opinion that the only reason that this is happening is because, of, because the select board gave them permission to do it. The select board needs to take that paragraph off of the liquor license immediately, so I'm no longer affected by this. That was a change. If it's a change to their liquor license, then it needs it's, to... You know what? Place. They still had, they were still serving outside. It's not as big of a change as you think. They had the patio outside. It, it's... You know, it, it was not a change of what they were doing. It's an expansion, yes. You know, they decided to utilize their yard. Scott and Bobby used to use the yard, not to the same extent, but they did. It's not, it's not really a change of it. I'm not dissing the fact that you're having this experience, but I, I got home from where I was Saturday night. I, got, I saw the phone messages. I saw the emails. I rode down there at, at 10.30, 10.40. I did not see a soul. I did not hear a thing. Police were both. It was, yeah. Yeah, so it's, um, you know. The police will be called again the next time it happens. Yeah. After dark. So yeah. it's like you get better results with the police and liquor control board. Yeah. Stick with it. Yeah. yeah. You've got a right to fight for your backyard. You know? <laughs> I'd just like to mention that along all these themes of community growth, uh, that growth and change is going to happen. Mm -hmm. If it's not what you like, then uh, you're working the, uh, work in the community uh, conversation into where it needs to be. But to take things to the level of legal action and additional costs to the town is pretty extreme. So uh, we have a short summer season here. People want to enjoy it. And uh, I'm sorry that your neighborhood has changed a little, but uh, I think those things happen. Burma. I just want to Spoken say from that, someone uh, on Bethel Mountain Road. <laughs> we, we live on a quiet street that has an Airbnb next to us, and we have to deal with loud people, unconscious people, people uh, slamming car doors, tweeting their door locks, going back and forth, talking really loudly, and it can be very disconcerting, very upsetting. It wakes the dog up. She starts barking. We're woken up, and what we have 
done is we've worked with our neighbor who owns the business. We're working with the neighbor. We're collaborating That's and trying job. to get people who are unwittingly doing things that are so disturbing. Well, all you can do is keep putting the effort into it because I don't want cars towed and then have to deal with that whole complication. So uh, I think it's very upsetting and it seems uh, very unconscious that people would behave in such a way. I get it. But this is a community and it is changing. It's not going to change. It is changing. I'm one of the old and shrinking. I know about this. So I, all I can say is, you know, this is what life is presenting. And, and it's the only thing is to make the best out of it, the best that you can, that's all. I don't want to sell the house. I don't want to move out because of these people across we the street. We don't want you to. So then take the paragraph off of the liquor license well, that you've changed to allow them to shove this piece of paper out and say, we can make as much noise as we want. Because if they can make as much noise as we want, that means everybody can make as much noise as they want. But everybody won't that, make as much noise as they want. No, and that was an extreme reactionary statement, I presume, on their part. You know, I think that this is, you know, I am feel like I'm a babysitter here, you know, and it's, um, it's, um, it's not going to happen like, okay, here, I just wrote that and now it's done. This is going to be in evolution and I'm willing to work with you and work with them on that, but um, I, I don't have a magic wand. I'm not in changing, change, we can't just, you know, retract their liquor license. There's been no um, violations from the liquor license per se. Well, we signed, the select board just signed an approval for the liquor license. The liquor board then approves that. It's the you know, and you're asking the planning board if that's a change of use. They say it's not a change of use. That's what the property has been used for. Now it's a matter of just finesse and working, getting through the upset and working with them to say, okay, you're, you're closed for the night. Why don't you unplug the lights? They don't need to be on all night. You know, now it's backed off from midnight. It's like they realize 10 o'clock is a good time to shut it down. Now you're saying that's too late or you want them to shut down at, you know, at dark, well, dark is 9.30 in the middle of the summer, but it's at 7.30 now, so it's we have to be, you know, I, I know you feel, I hear that you're feeling taken advantage of and, and ignored, and, and that's not... That's not the case. That's, you know, it's, that's not the case, but that's not acceptable either, and we're not trying to make anybody the bad guy here, but I think that I'm, I urge you to be patient and try and, and work this out, you know. It's, um, but you did move across the street from a tavern, you know, that's, that's, and that's part of the village and we're a struggling village and we're, we're blessed that we have two places where you can go out to, to eat dinner and we have two places where you can go out to have breakfast or lunch and a lot of villages don't, you know, don't have anything like that and it's, it's, and we struggle to, to keep those, those, and, and that's what the whole presentation earlier was about, how do we, you know, increase the vibrancy here. In a, in a measured way that doesn't make life bad for some people. It's just about, you know, it's just, uh, the job in a select board here is not about trying to, to take care of one person's problem. It's about everybody as a whole and trying to protect the village as a whole, the town as a whole, even the people out in the sticks, right, Harlan? <laughs> yeah. Oh, May yeah, okay, <laughs> yeah, but, um, <laughs> yeah, so um, I, that's all I can do is ask you to, to you know, be patient we'll and, keep and, and, the goal. and Nancy have something to say. Well, I think we should be grateful that there are people who came and purchased that in. Um, <laughs> yeah. It could be a rundown place like it, um, several of the buildings in town have become or were before. These people came here. Um, energetically came here uh, and they aren't accustomed to living in small communities um, and I think we should be grateful that they keep the place as nice as they do and that they're trying to stay here um, we could have another vacant business Tony I 
maybe you could work on noise abatement in your house, some kind of music or uh, a little bit of uh, an insulation situation. Uh, that might help. And hard when your windows are open, though. <laughs> well, <laughs> we have our windows open, too. We only live a little ways uh, above you, and we never hear a sound. We don't either. Well, my children. Well, I'm. I mean, so you're talking about the windows right on the on the street there? Yeah. Yeah. So have you experimented with maybe closing those and open the other ones? I mean, I don't know your house and how I understand it. You are the most. You know, the sound is a big brick building. I'm sure it's going to echo. I mean, before they started partying on the lawn, I'm sure that when there was a bunch of people on the porch, it was just as loud honestly, coming in there. Honestly, you know, truly, it, it never was. Never I mean, was. Even and all that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Schmucks. I'm not. I'm There's not be, disagreeing that you're hearing this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But. But it was very exuberant. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we'll continue to try and moderate this. Um, you know, in terms of, um, you know, telling them that they can't have their business there. I don't know if we can take that step for you. I don't know. Yeah. Um, does anyone else have anything else they want to say on that? No. All right. Um, um, just go on to something. Um, Frank, what have you got for us tonight? Well, actually, I'm, I'm pleased to note that the um, infrastructure of Lower Maple Hill has become considerably more resilient. Right? Yeah. And I, I wanted to give um, Cooter an opportunity to talk about all the work he and the road crew have been doing on culverts and ditches and. Mm -hmm. That would come with the highway report. That would, um... No, I'm mean, giving you an opportunity to say that you got the good work you've been doing. Well, I'll say yay. We've been ditching and changing some cross drain drawings. Right. That's going to come with his highway report. All over. Yeah. Are we there yet? We're never totally there yet. Yeah, but, um, <laughs> we haven't got through Joan yet, folks. Yeah. But, uh, but, I, but I just, I guess this is a way of saying. Right, we want to hear know, from you thank right you now. For, thank you for being responsive to you know, some of my concerns. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, I, I mean, there, there's a there's a there's a large culvert, right? That's 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 empty, that's empty and that wasn't there before, and he and and they, and the, the road crew they did a very good job of. Creating the beginning of you know what, well, creating really a swale. Right? I mean, I, I didn't get everything that I wanted. I really wanted the culvert to be parallel to Maple Hill Road, but I understand that the town has a right to maintain existing drainages. But I thought I just wanted to respond to a really, you know, what I thought was a really good effort by the by the road crew and the road foreman to. A really improved uh, condition that affected a lot of people. Right? Yeah, thank and you. There are culverts all the way down the road that were replaced. And mm -hmm. I guess there's one, you know, up above, uh, you know, the great big ones. So. Your time had come, Frank. <laughs> yeah. All in due time. Yeah. So, <laughs> you're. Well, this is a. It's a thank you, Cody. Yep. Just a, for once and for once, so somebody saying. They did good. And I'll second that. Oh, we say that all the time. I third it. And and Route One Hundred, I'm seeing a lot of work on Route One Hundred. Is that all state? Yeah, that's that's all yeah. state work. Yeah, it's all state work. Martha, you have. Just in, in, re, uh, in response to what he said about Route One Hundred, I mean, I drive it every day now because I have to take a long way to work in Randolph, and with all the patching and work that they've done, which is really great. 
does that mean that they might possibly actually be paid that section? No. No? No. It no. means they're passionate. No. I, I mean, it's been several years since I've been hearing Someday. every year, every year that they, we might be on the list. Holding on. <laughs> okay, I should just keep poking still. Yeah. Well, as much yeah. as we're on the list. We're well, not, thank you, Frank. We're but not do they, washed do out. They, I mean, does the state or VTrans coordinate with the town about what they're up to? Not, not, no. not really. No. When they want, when they want, right? When they need something from the town. I emergencies pop up and the list just stays there. And yeah. so, as if if Mother Nature would leave us be for a few years, we could catch up on the list. Well, it's considerably less funky than it was. So <laughs> I, I it. Well, yeah. right, it, it is. was a lot worse when I first started taking the long way around back in April. Well, thank you, Frank. Yeah. So I guess the road topic would segue into Joan giving us uh, updates <coughs> that you've got on the progress on Bethel Mountain Road. Oh, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Who's the road guy? Yeah, <laughs> you can pitch in. You just heard my report. Yeah, I'll be a little bit more verbose than you were then. We're uh, doing a better job. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to Necessarily. So, okay. Site one, Bethel Mountain Road, the lower part. Uh, work is going well. Uh, some areas are ahead of schedule. Others are just on schedule, but looks pretty good so far for completing the main part, the part they're working on now uh, by October 11th. Uh, the slope work, which includes 20 culverts being added, um, along with concrete head walls that are poured in place, footings, and the outfall, which is where the water comes out, as opposed to where it comes in, um, will be finished by next week. All those will be done by next week, which is a huge amount of work. And if any of you have the chance to walk Bethel Mountain Road after after, after, after six o'clock, after six o'clock, when the crews aren't there, um, it's pretty darn impressive. Um, it's it's quite a piece of work, and it's still going on. Um, <coughs> next week is when they'll start doing the road surface work itself. Um, which is actually, you know, the roadway as opposed to all the, the drainage on either side and ditching as well. Those two things, are, they're going to be starting next week. Actually, some ditching um, may have started today. Uh, they're starting from the bottom and working their way up. Um, and reclaiming is going to start, which is part of the road resurfacing. Um, it's going to start on September, the week of September 26th. That's the first part of the resurfacing. That's, that's where we, that's where we we're making a comeback. That's reclaiming asphalt. So taking up what's there now because there are many places, layers upon layers upon layers, kind of like an archaeological site, um, and then get to the the base, and that's when they'll start uh, paving on top of that. And if I'm not explaining it very well, I'm not an expert. So if anybody wants to add <laughs> and improve on my explanation. No? Okay. No, going twice. Okay. On to site 1B, which is the, the added site from the Doherty property up to the yes. intersection with Middle Hollow Road. Um, du Bois and King, our engineers, are still working on plans and costs. Uh, Tatro did give, his, give us his estimate for that work of about $280,000, um, so which is quite a bit. Uh, he expects it's going to take about three weeks and not clear at all at this point whether he's going to be able to complete that section by October 11th. It's very possible that he will not be able to do that. Um, still a bit of engineering work to be done and uh, things needing to go through mm -hmm. the trans and then maybe uh, But for the process. most part, the road will be open and they'll be working on that with flaggers. Oh. Although we discussed, would it be quicker if we closed it? But I, I believe the road will be open, and mm. they'll be working during the day with traffic control. Uh, so then, moving on to Bethel Mountain Road Site Two, which is the part from the intersection and going out the upper part to the town line. Um, through those of you who were at the last select board meeting, will know that this is going through a VTrans IDIQ process. Um, and there will be a pre-bid meeting held on Wednesday for interested contractors. Um, Wednesday. Wednesday. 
Um, this is a, a limited bid process, uh, and it must comply, it still has to comply with the town's procurement policy. So I took a look at that um, to make sure, and our policy is actually silent on this kind of situation where um, E-Trans is, you know, doing the bid process and they're sending it out, they sent it out to somewhere between 50 and 20 pre-approved contractors. So, but it wasn't um, advertised publicly. So um, the question was, you know, does it still comply with our procurement policy? And I said, I believe it did. Um, if only because there's nothing covered by that in the policy. It's a pretty simple one we have. So what I propose to do, just to sort of have belt and suspenders on that issue, is I'll uh, write up a resolution uh, which lays out, gives points for why you believe <coughs> that it does comply with your pro mm -hmm. procurement policy and the reasons for undertaking this with the trans the way we're doing it and then you can sign it, and that will just be something yeah. in the file which, you know, says you, you thought about it, you looked at it, you believe that it's fully yeah. approvable the way it is. So I, I didn't get a chance to do that today, but I'll get it to you in the next few days. Okay. You can look at it, add to it, whatever. Um, that's all I have. Thank you for continuing your work on that. It's good. Um, Terry's not here. So we do have, um, is that, that's the resolution that we're talking that was on the agenda that, but you don't have that yet? Right. Yeah, okay, yeah. All right. Um, and um, any news from the library back there? Well, Jeanette has put up a long list of programs for September and early part of October over all on the bulletin board. And I think the, uh, the biggest thing is that our last stained glass window has been installed or yep. installed. Yep. It's really a pretty spectacular one. Are these ones that Mitch Scanlon has been yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. A long process. And yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's um, Marvin, you had something you wanted to talk about. Yes, just a little bit. Uh, I appreciate hearing about the visions, but my vision is getting duller <laughs> and so forth. But uh, anyway, because of Mason bringing out to the select board uh, uh, last meeting, and I wasn't here, uh, that he brought out, how does the select board feel about the Forest Service uh, lack of uh, community <laughs> or, or uh, neighbor's input. And I've got to go back to the point that I'm glad that the, I love trees, but I'm not a tree hugger, and so forth. They are a crop, as is an oak crop or a hay crop. They are a crop. They need to be harvested, and so forth, and hopefully put to good. And so that will help prevent fires and give wildlife more, uh, more uh, access. However, I am a, the, uh, I asked Julie to put it down, renewable natural resource, and absolutely that's where I'm coming from. I, I believe I heard Mason say tonight that our, our, sewer, our sewer treatment is going into the White River. Well, it is not. Our sewage treatment is completely underground. It does not go into the river. The stormwater is still going yeah. into I the river. I did not say that. You didn't say that. In the future, I don't hear a potential well. problem. What's that? Well, I did not say it was going into the river. Okay. Well, anyway, the river has now been reclassified, declassified, if you would, as of after we took our a sanitary sewer out of the river. It was declassified probably in about 1980 to where no sewage treatment plant can ever dump into the White River north of the, of the confluence of the Tweed River and the White. That is, that is the classification will forbade that. And that is a, is a good thing. But the other thing we have for an issue is, is the fact of, uh, of our wildlife and that is the river. The river and the woods is wildlife, and I certainly like it, all of the wildlife, and that's why I'm saying I I can't look too far into the future, but I could go a long way back to where the Forest Service was doing no logging, and until 
uh, uh, 1948, if you would, in, in this part. They didn't have, didn't have an office here until 1960, and that office, office was in the hardware, uh, where the paint department and the garden supplies are now. They had about two people here, plus the uh, secretary. But anyway, my father and, and Raleigh Bostick is the one that got him here as the a friend of, of, of knowing Gary Wheeler, the, the, Gary, the, uh, the, the forest supervisor in Rutland. We did not have a satellite office until they came to Rochester. And they had already got acquainted with Rochester because at the result of the fire of our church in New Year's Eve of 1944, uh, we needed to rebuild it. The Forest Service gave the timber uh, from the Rutland office, gave the timber in 1948 to be cut by John Eaton and Dave Eaton, uh, along and through, and milled by the Eaton Lumber, Co Lumber Company to rebuild the church. And that was what the Forest Service did back then. They didn't have to have any, any community input back then. As a matter of fact, that's quite new. It's only been about 30 years that they've had to have an impact study. Mm -hmm. And so and that opens up everything. It has cost the Forest Service more to have a timber sale uh, as, with these impact studies that they got for the timber. Now, they were harvesting it and they were selling it. However, they were not making any money. And so forth, and but it needs to be harvested and 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 controlled, like our wildlife it needs to be harvested, and so forth. I don't uh, deer, the deer need to have a place to roam, and they've got these places, and more and more new landowners are posting the land against hunting. Well, that is a is a handicap for our uh, fishing game officials. The way I feel is that we don't know enough. Us lay people out here know enough to to uh, have the, uh, tell the Forest Service, no, you can't cut that tree, and so forth. We got to rely on their expertise, and I think that we need to do that. That is my vision, <laughs> but by the same token, I can't look a long ways ahead. Thank you. It's just Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Marvin. See you here. Yeah. Well said. All right. Yeah. yeah you got it. Um, we have a couple bids here for the North Hollow Northview Drive, um, Sierra Drive. Um, it's ditching, right? And I am not sure, since Tom is not here, that we can make a decision on here because we've got um, two bids, one from ECS and one from I'll see in a second if I can get it. It's a very good envelope. <laughs> it is. You said sealed. It's a very sealed, yes. Excuse me, Patty. He said this is for North Hollow and North Northview Drive. It's the intersection of North Hollow and Northview Drive area, correct? Yeah. And then, what is the other one? Sayara. Uh, Sayara. Sierra, Sierra Drive. Kirkpatrick. Just, just two copies of the same thing? Is that what we got? Sierra Drive. Yes. That's the name of it. Site one and yes. site two. And this one is, I'm not saying which site that is. I assume it's site one and site two. We've got a bid from Excavate, and it's the same amount of, um, no, not quite the same amount. We've got 2,700. Let's see which one is site one and site two here. No, they're both same distance. Same distance. Oh, here we go. North View yes, near is. Sierra Drive. So for the uh, North Hollow North View, it's 2760. And for the Sierra Drive, it's 2700. And that's from Excavate. And from ECS Excavating. For um, North Hollow Road, we've got 3606, and for the Sierra Drive, 3786. And I'm thinking that since you are involved with Excavate, that you have to recuse yourself from this. And since that leaves me as the only one here, we have to put this on hold until I can join with Tom and we have uh, enough people to, to vote on this. So. At least we have the bids in the, in the record, and then we'll go from there. So, uh, 
Thank you for that. And then I guess we'll have to warn another meeting and, and discuss that. So, um, I think that's enough, right? Wait. If you have a question back there, I can tell. Well, no? Was was something. no. We're not done yet, are we? No. I think so. Was, was Walt Wells on there? For oh wait, no, oh, Walt. Oh yeah, Walt. I'm sorry, Walt. Walt you had to say something about the Harvest Fair. I see you in there. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to comment that uh, for those who don't know, the Park House Board is not trying to put a generator over there. It's a group of citizens <coughs> that have gotten together to try to try to do this project, and so that group of citizens wants to thank the. Harvest Fair attendees and vendors who generously gave the other day. Let them know we'll be around for some other functions because mm -hmm. it's a big project. Yeah. But thank you. All right. Thank you. Well said. All right. Anybody else before we uh, close this off tonight? Thank you all for coming. It was oh, wait, a minute, wait, what? A wait a minute. What? On the agenda. Huh? On the agenda. Old business. Oh, what? The missing book. I guess since I have nothing else to say about that, I just figured that's getting a little redundant down there. Well, yeah. Yeah, I know. We haven't found yeah. it. It's like 20, 30 years of like select board meeting minutes that are mm -hmm. gone. I mean, I'm curious. What are the dates that are missing? Uh, yeah, 20 to the 50s. 1920s. It's bigger all the time, doesn't it? It does get bigger. I didn't think it was that big. No. Uh, yeah, I didn't no. think so. No. So that, yeah, I have nothing more to report on that. I, Great. Yeah. All right. Anything else? Is there any further looking for it downstairs? Is that the last place it could be? Yeah, it's like No, I, I don't believe there has. There have been... Um, busy trying to fix the tax bills after the supervisory union threw a big wrench in those works. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You can the front page of the hero that appears to be fixed. Yes. It appears to be yeah, fixed. All right. Mason, one something else you want to uh, I wasn't sure, but I mean the Windsor Sheriff Michael, I mean, real or perceived lost minutes, maybe it's time just to report them, just so that the townspeople feel like there's some reliability that at least we know there's a process. Is um, it a process or not? I mean, that bolt over there is pretty serious to us. And when does it become time that if it's real or perceived that there's missing minutes, well, why don't we report it? I mean, what's so I think it's that? reported every meeting that comes no, up. No, no. comes up. potentially have stolen records, real or perceived. Where are they? So just report it. Let somebody else handle it. Windsor, Michael, is this Windsor okay. Sheriff? Thanks for the suggestion. Well, it's a great yeah. visit. Yeah. All right. Um, last call for comments, and we're going to move on. Thank everybody, and let's uh, go forth and nurture our little town. Yeah.